Hello again, everybody. Scott Bowden, right along ringside and ready to go with another big day of the KFR podcast. And joining me, as always, the greatest co-host there is, was, and ever will be, the great Brian Last. Uh, Scott. The, the, hang on, hang on, Lou, hang on. The great. No, well, well, yeah, yeah. I just got a message from Brian. Uh, he's forgotten he's working on uh, the drive through with Jim Cornette today. Uh, so, and and then after that, he's talking to John Arezzi. Well, what about? And, and then after that, Ron Fuller. He's doing a couple of podcasts with Ron Fuller. Mm. And, and then uh, he's putting the finishing touches on uh, 605 Super Podcast Episode 100. Right, right, which we all may be 100 by the time it comes out. Uh, okay, well, tell you what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna call Brian. I'm just gonna call him really, really quick. Hang on a second. Um, I'm just, yeah, oh, no, 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 okay. hang on. I, I just, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but hang on a second. I mean, this is my <clears> first <throat> big show in quite a while. I thought he wanted to be here with me. Hang on. I, I, well, I, we'll get the, we'll yeah. get this. Hang on. I, oh, sh- That is voicemail. Mm, mm-hmm. I just, I just, I, I'll leave him a little. Boy, this is long. <sighs> Boy, you thought the 605 was a bloated exercise. Hey, Brian! Brian! Uh, yeah, Scott here. Uh, about to do a KFR wraparounds. Uh, thought we were, thought we were doing it today. <clears throat> Lou, just tell me you're, you're busy busy let me tell you something you are full of my friend you're a do you hear me a I, i'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry to use those words on the kfr podcast i apologize to all my friends out there but you you're a do you hear me a, i will get you for this we'll be back with more kfr right after this Sensational night of action coming up Monday night. Get your tickets all day today until 5 o'clock and then all day on Monday. And that, my friend, will give you a chance to be there early enough to see all of the action. Be there for a fight. Right now. Here he comes. Guy we were just going to crawl in. We love Jerry Lawler. By golly, got the fans over there testifying at Jerry. Good for you to be out here. I uh, want to get into you in a moment about uh, your big international championship match. Uh, but Fred, you got um, something coming up Monday night on the Letterman show. Is that correct? Well, uh, they just uh, the producer of the show called me the other day from New York and and asked uh, had there ever been any any litigation or any legal uh, you know entanglements following the little incident that I had with Andy Kaufman yeah. on uh, the David Letterman show about a year ago and uh, I told him at that time that I hadn't heard I expected to be sued after the thing but I told him I hadn't heard anything from Kaufman since then so he told me that uh, you know they were glad of that because they had had more requests and letters and telegrams that people wanted to see the show again, so they wanted to rerun it. So anyway, I guess since they found out there's no lawsuits involved, Monday night on the David Letterman show, they're going to re-show the program where uh, where I slept uh, the taste out of Kaufman's oh, mouth. Oh, yeah. Bang him right back out of that chair and yeah. then a few of the little bleep, 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 bleep. Yeah, that's, that's going to be on Monday oh. night. Uh, Okay, let me get out of something a little bit more serious in there. We'll enjoy watching that on TV5 on the Letterman show Monday night. When Lance Russell announced the Memphis card at the Mid-South Coliseum for November 23rd, 1981, I immediately called to pester my Uncle Robert until he agreed to take me to the matches. This was our typical formula. Uh, On this particular day, however, my uncle was easier to pin down than, say, Pat Hutchinson or any number of Memphis jobbers over the years. And when I say jobbers, I don't mean that in a derogatory term. I say that lovingly. (laughs) Jobbers. Uh, You see, the world champion was coming to town. And even my uncle was curious to see if this huge star, whose appeal transcended mere professional wrestling, could whip not one, not two, not three, but four. Count them, four members of the audience. Because you see, that's just what world intergender champion slash TV star Andy Kaufman 
promised to do on this chilly night in 1981. And who better to review the talented Taxi Technician's Memphis run, but the wrestling humorist himself, Scott Cornish. Welcome to KFR, Scott. Oh, thank you for having me here. Yes, who better? I yes, who? Who? I, ooh, I, 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 say that, I, I say that rhetorically. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is no answer to the question because... Uh, there, 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 could, there can't be. Uh, now, well, you know what? I, I think that all, you I, and, you, go ahead. No, just you and I are uh, are definitely uh, longtime fans of Andy Kaufman in all his various iterations. It was kind of amazing. I had always been a fan of him from the first time that I saw him, even before Saturday Night Live on things like the Dick Van Dyke Show and uh, other various appearances. Boy, I, I remember him going quite a ways back. So I was already died in the wool, big Andy Kaufman fan. And when I started seeing that, uh, <laughs> one of my other main interests, professional wrestling was, uh, was something that he was incorporating into, into his stage performances. Uh, it was really something unbelievable. I got a chance to see him. Well, uh, maybe we were getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, you were talking about the, uh, the first night that you saw him at, uh, mid, mid South Coliseum. Yeah, yeah, uh, but you got to see him two years prior, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, he did. He was kind of doing yeah. the same same act where he's wrestling women. Uh, was it at Syracuse University? Yeah, yeah. He he did a short chapel in Syracuse University, and he was well known at that time. He I think he had already debuted on Taxi. Certainly, people had seen him on Saturday Night Live, and they were well aware of you know how unusual his act was back at the time that I saw him was right about the time he was doing things like uh, playing Carnegie Hall and taking people out for milk and cookies after. So people knew this wide ranging act that he had, but uh, seeing him there that night, that was the first time I ever saw him do anything uh, regarding professional wrestling. He uh, took his leave uh, in the middle of this act at one point and went and got into his, you know, (laughs) <laughs> what we know is his wrestling gear, the black tights and the, uh, <laughs> the long johns and the, and the, the bath, the bathrobe well, and underneath it, and underneath it, all the t-shirts that says, I love grandma. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, his aide de camp, his, uh, his, uh, collaborator, Bob Zamuda comes out while he's off stage and he's got a referee shirt on and he does the quick pitch. Uh, any women from the audience who want to come up and wrestle Andy Kaufman, um, you know, there's five hundred dollars if you can uh, beat him in in however long the period of time was it three one minute rounds or what have you. And this is a hip uh, college crowd that knows Andy Kaufman. and there was a big crowd there for the show, and they were really enjoying the show up to that point. And so he gets a couple of volunteers up on his stage, and then he does what you later would see him do on Saturday Night Live and this, where he would come out and. Yeah, <laughs> it was very much, uh, you know, part of the plan. He was hoping to hook up with these women after the show, so he would pick the ones that appealed to him the most to, uh, <laughs> to wrestle on stage. Absolutely. And, they, and according to Zamuda, who's a well-known con man and liar, <laughs> he usually ended up uh, uh, hooking up with at least one of, uh, one of his opponents. But he comes out, and I'm already in hysterics because he's, he's – doing the strut and uh, Buddy Rogers kind of strut and the sneering and the, the, the doing a, a heel wrestling bit, which I'm already, you know, totally into. I'm, I'm all about it. Uh, but when he actually started having the matches, I think people just, I don't know what they thought they were going to see, but when he started doing like he and Zamuda started doing like subtle heel maneuvers or non so subtle heel maneuvers, you know, he wasn't really kicking these women. He was giving them like, work kicks and things like that strutting around and, and being very arrogant the audience turned on him they, mm. so they took <laughs> the bait act, they absolutely took the bait this hip college crowd completely took the bait and i'm not even sure how he got out of it although he won one or two matches that he had pretty easily and then they moved on to some other section of the show but i was amazed at uh that uh that incident to see that and that was april somewhere in april let's say in 79 
And that's okay. well before I'd ever seen him do anything like that on television. I think I, I would watch just anything that he was on. So if he was on the Tomorrow Show, I started seeing him bring it up, you know, mm -hmm. the intergender champion. And uh, he wants to challenge this person or that person. I remember him specifically targeting and doing a, a, a real pro wrestling promo about Moolah and uh, challenging Moolah. The oh, even wow. better one that I... <laughs> the even better challenge that I saw was the famous swimmer Diana Nyad. You know? <laughs> well, I don't know if I, I now I don't know the name of the uh, there was a Playboy Playmate that he had a, a well publicized uh, row with. Oh, that's right. And I'm not, and I, I believe that's the that's the, the the young woman he was challenging when he appeared at Madison Square Garden. Um, you know, he went to the matches often there, uh, but he was yeah. uh, near the ringside area, and uh, Vince. McMahon Jr. or you know the Vince McMahon we know today uh, was right. was doing the comment and interviewed him at ringside and Vince is just loving it. You can just tell he's you know he's 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 totally getting it. He's laughing and a coffin basically ends up cutting a hill promo. Uh, I don't know if if Vince quite <laughs> knew the direction the interview was going to go. I think they were just trying to take advantage. Hey, we got celebrities here at Madison Square Garden. Um, oh yeah. And it, you you have to think that uh, that Vince was he he says in hindsight he looks back on it and he goes yeah that should have that should have been our moment you know we should have had Andy Kaufman there at Madison Square Garden but but really it you know even though he it's interesting that you say he was able to turn that college crowd it's 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 one you know it it was tailor made for Memphis and I I like to I like to think uh, that it wouldn't have quite worked anywhere else the way it did. And it, it had been as heated if it, if it hadn't been with Lawler and in Memphis. But it's interesting that that you say that the that even a college crowd at, at Syracuse couldn't quite help themselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's strange thinking about that interview with Vince. If if they had done it, yeah, it never would have taken off like it did in Memphis. I can't even imagine what what they would have done at that time. Well, it, it, I imagine it would have been probably a short one and done, you know, with him. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they would have agreed to have it not choreographed in some way, though. Like, you know, in Memphis, I think the the fans were a bit savvier than than you give them credit for. Or a lot of people give uh, Southern wrestling fans credit for Uh they willingly check their disbelief at the door. I I asked Jerry Jarrett, you know, what what percentage of the fans in the heyday, you know, uh, or in my heyday anyway, 80, 81, 82, where the crowds were so strong on a consistent basis, you know, typically between uh, six and 8,000 every Monday night and then dropped in with the occasional sellout uh, of 11,365 plus. And he, he said, you know, maybe uh, 80% uh, – uh, of the fans, I, I think I think eighty percent of the fans knew that what was going on was a show. Uh, right. Now that doesn't say, that doesn't mean that eighty percent or eighty five percent. He said it may even be, even be higher than that. Uh, so, not which is not to say that eighty or eighty five percent were in on it and knew how it worked because they didn't, and that was where right. the the appeal and, and the mystery came in, you know, they weren't quite sure how it was done. Uh, but they certainly didn't believe that everything necessarily was on the up and up. And then you have, you know, school kids like me, like I, I wanted to hang on to that, but, and I defended pro wrestling to a lot of my friends whose parents, you right. know, really kind of killed everything. You know, my, my dad was always very careful because I think, he didn't want me to grow up too fast. And if I loved this thing that I believed was real, that, so he would kind of answer ambiguously to me when I questioned him about the business. Um, mm. And even, for, you know, and he even he didn't know for sure. I mean, I think he was probably thinking that uh, that the blood was was blood capsules um, for, for probably a long time. You know, that, that's one thing that you couldn't quite explain, because I, I would point out, look at the scar tissue. Look at the, you know, <laughs> and you never you never dreamed that that's what they were doing to to get blood. I mean, who's who's crazy enough to do something like that? Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it's so it's 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 it's, it's, interesting. it's cool. I, I wish I could. It, it sounds like we, we were in two different two completely different atmospheres, but the end result was the yeah. same. Uh, fans wanting to to ring Kaufman's neck for this. Oh yeah, 
Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, as I sometimes say about other things, it could only have happened the way that it did happen. It was really perfect. They try to plug him in. He made a few appearances here and there. He he had he did he wrestled women on a show in Detroit, which must have been a I guess it was a a, a chic show, you know. And I don't oh, even wow. know. Never Jeez. saw footage of it, <laughs> but, but I saw it mentioned. I went, that that doesn't sound good. Although they had all kinds of crazy stuff going on on those shows. I don't. <laughs> no, I I, don't know I, I didn't know that. They, they I didn't know draw that. the line there. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, and yeah, in Detroit sounds like a place that, yeah, certainly would welcome that kind of, if, if Vince senior, if it was too, too show businessy for, for Vince senior, then yeah, it sounds tailor made for, for Memphis, Detroit, probably Southwest, uh, championship <laughs> wrestling, uh, any, you know, and maybe, maybe even Georgia, uh, it depends on who, well, and not with only booking, certainly. Uh, Oli wouldn't have allowed that on his show, probably. But uh, and you could even you could even argue like some of the stuff that the coffin was spewing was typical Southern man rhetoric, you know, like women belong in the kitchen, and you know, hey, who could argue with that? Mm. But it's it's but you know when I saw I was a huge fan of Taxi. Um, you know, I was only I was I was ten years old, and my but my dad really. Uh, uh, had had great taste in movies and comedy, and especially with if if something was a comedy, there was more leeway whether or not I could watch it or not. And I I just know that I was allowed to watch things that that my other friends were not allowed to watch. Uh, and certainly if it was on a, a comedic level, uh, a lot of my friends could not watch Siren Out Live, uh, which is when I first saw Andy uh, doing the Mighty Mouse, mm-hmm. um, but they couldn't watch Soap. Which was controversial for for the time, uh, yeah, yeah. I remember my third grade teacher being floored. That she's like, "Your parents," and I had no one to talk to. I, I would I would want to talk about the show the next day at school, and none of my friends had any point of reference because they could they weren't allowed to. Watch. You know, you're in the Bible Belt, and you have a. I mean, oh my gosh, a gay character. You know, um, and that was just one of the things that I think riled people up. Uh, but so I, I was I was exposed to Andy a lot, and so for me it was this was a huge deal. Uh, but the house the house was actually down. <laughs> uh, I think the previous week in Memphis they drew fifty eight hundred fans, and for this show they do fifty fifty three hundred. So his first his first appearance where he was going to wrestle the women or yeah when he, yeah when he, when he, when he, when he wrestled Lawler. oh no 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 that that drew decent that drew that drew pretty well. But it's it's oh it's, yeah. It, one thing, one unique thing, but because of his busy schedule, he wasn't able to come in and and build on these things. But see, that is a testament to me of of just how much heat he had because his appearances were so spread out. I think if he had his brothers, th- he would have loved to have uh, been able to stay in Memphis and do this. But uh, you know, he yeah. had his commitments and he was on this hit TV show. Uh, cause I'm pretty sure that, that uh, taxi at that time was maybe the, I think it was the number two or three rated show on television and then, mm-hmm. and, and how, did, how did it start? I, I mean, I've seen that, that, uh, I'm from Hollywood. <laughs> did it start with, uh, with interviews that he taped and sent in? Or did he just suddenly appear on the show one week? I believe they, they showed clips of his, uh, one of his other appearances where he wrestled women from the audience. And so, and I didn't have a lot. No, I had not seen much of that. I I had heard of it, and I think that uh, that I found a, like maybe an old issue of one of my dad's Playboys, and they had an article on a brief thing on Kaufman doing it. And but it, I wasn't prepared for 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 what I was going to see because he did a lot. You know, Memphis always encouraged guys to to get on the mic at ringside and get on the fans, and and so it and that was a very key part of the act. And, and I remember being a little confused. Because uh, you know, I wanted to believe that that wrestling was real, and here you had this guy who was one way on this hit TV show, and he's pulling out all the stops and doing everything he can to to turn the crowd against him, or at least get a reaction. Wow. And, and they weren't even sure where to put him on the card. I, I think was was one thing. So they had him come out fourth. I think after the first intermission, uh, when they came back, he came out and quickly. Uh, got the got the crowd very riled up, and it and it almost seemed to build uh, slowly. Like you know, he 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 
pick the first way. And another thing I think, I think too, that, that added to the realism of it, obviously is that he refused to have it, uh, it, it called it, the fans picked out in advance. He refused to have plants in the audience. And Jerry Jarrett was like, Andy, I, I know that you've done this before, uh, up in New York and, <laughs> and, and some different places, but these, some of these women down here, some of these big plow women will clean your clock. <laughs> If you're not careful, but he absolutely insisted on it. And it just, it just so happens that one of the women on this night was Foxy. Now she came and she was third, you know, they, they kind of obviously play around with the timeline a little bit in, in the movie. Uh, but she was the third woman he wrestled and she, she really tested him. Um, and, and, and he got, he was exhausted by the time he beat, but he did, he did, he did pin her. Uh, <laughs> let's skip the devil is due. He was able to, to finally, finally get her down for the three count. But, the, but the crowd at the, at this point, the crowd was way into it because she almost got him a couple of times and she was on top of him and just flailing away. And it took everything he had to, <laughs> to get on top of her and get a pin. And even then, I think maybe the referee even counted a little bit, maybe when, when her shoulder was up just to, cause he, he realized that, that coffin was struggling um, yeah. and they even had, they even had him do one more and he couldn't pin it cause he was so exhausted after Foxy, but Foxy is the one that the crowd really got behind, but he even wrestled another woman after that. Uh, and they said that the time limit ran out <laughs> cause I think he was completely, <laughs> cause he was completely gassed at that point. Um, was and- Foxy, uh, was Foxy a well-known ringside fan? Did she have any? Any was she an aspiring wrestler? Did she have any connection to wrestling? Did was she I don't known think in the, so. In the Coliseum I, as a, I don't think so. I, I I don't think she was. I don't think she was. I don't remember her being. Now I only got to go to the Coliseum about six times a year, and so it. You know, I had to be very careful with choosing my my dates. You know, because I was always right. trying. To, I, I was always trying to to figure out. Okay, is this is? I didn't even know what the blow off to a feud was. I didn't know. Right. Uh, when the world champion was going to come into town a lot of times. Um, and you tried to time these things. Um, and, but with Kaufman, it, it was, it was a no brainer. I mean, it was like, it was seriously, it, I, that's why I made that comparison in, in the opening. It really was like the world champion was coming to town. This was something special that you're not going <laughs> to see that often. Yeah. That must've uh, been so bizarre when he, he gets there and then he's, uh, you know, he turns the audience on him in front of your, uh, the young, yeah. impressionable eyes. Exactly. <laughs> I, thought, I, think, I thought he was going to do Mighty Mouse or some funny, yeah, funny I did, fantasy routine. I, you know? I, thought it, I thought it was good. I mean, I, I knew a little bit, of, like I said, I knew a little bit about the wrestling deal. But I I really thought that it was going to be more tongue-in-cheek. I had no idea that they were going to go, uh, you know. And or somebody again, goes after him and Lawler comes to save him or something. Yeah, and, they, and you know, and when they, <laughs> set, when they set up the rematch with Foxy, now that now that was planned. It was That was going to go that way yeah. with when Lawler would come in and, and try to intervene and then shove him on his butt. They'd already kind of decided the direction at that point. But, uh, you know, Andy was not even able to come in, back into town uh, for the rest of the year. You know, this, they had to pick it back up in 82, but there was still that, that, that momentum, that, that heat from it and the fans remembered. So it really is a testament to, to Andy that he was able to come in the crowd. You know, the crowd was actually down from the previous week. No one was looking at this as having any kind of impact. Uh, they didn't really understand yeah. what, what it was. And, and, and maybe a lot of fans who get, went to the rest of the matches, you know, weren't necessarily fans of taxi. I, you know, this that show, uh, even though it was very popular was, was maybe not for everybody. It was, it was a little bit more highbrow than I think your typical sitcom of the day. Mm-hmm. At least I, I at least yeah. I remember it being that way. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I remember Jerry Jarrett talking about, well, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but people were saying that, um, his match so far <laughs> when he has the, the big confrontation with, with Andy. Uh, Jerry Turin said that was never presented as the main event of the night. That was sort of, if, I, if I'm quoting him correctly, that was sort of like an added attraction. That was like a manager match, which you would be familiar with. You know, the, the thing that would be lower on the card. 
In fact, if you look at those results, any time that he had something going on, that Lawler had something going on with Andy Kaufman, he had another match on the show against yeah. Dundee or, <laughs> yeah. or whoever that, it would be. On this case, it was the monk. Who he beat? Oh, wow. who, who he, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but this was a guy that <laughs> Jimmy Hart was. It was this a, a guy who probably wouldn't main event anywhere else but Memphis because of <laughs> because Memphis is such you know could could be such a gimmick town on occasion, and you know they had great yeah. workers up and down the card, but then you would have guys who would kind of maybe get a run with Lawler just because of the gimmick. On, the, on even on the night that I went, Lawler was probably in the. I mean, he he was working third from the top against. Uh, Super Destroyer, uh, which is not Bill Irwin, but Bill Dromo, who had, you know, oh, bounced, <laughs> yeah, who was kind of in the twilight yeah. of his career, but they had gotten the over, journeyman, yeah. With the, yeah, journeyman, but they had gotten him over big time because he had good size. Uh, and Lawler did this, this great deal on television where, uh, you know, he was upset by the, by, by the big guy and bloodied and really just, it was a perfect example of how Lawler could get somebody over, uh, who was not nearly as talented as he was. Um, and then Lawler, yeah. Lawler comes out, he's all bandaged up and he, and he's like going, you know, I, I feel like I, you know, I under, underestimated this guy. And, uh, I feel like, you know, I really, really let wow. my fans, my, I really let my fans down and I know that they're hurting right now, just as much as I hurt. And, um, you know, I'm going to do my best to make it up. You know, just really this impassioned plea for the fans not to, not, oh, to, not so good at that. Oh, just so good, and, and it made it made him. You know, I always say that Lawler did more uh, j- clean jobs than probably any top baby face in the country. Uh, mm. But the the fans, I think, admired you know loved him uh, when he did stumble because it made him human like them. Because God knows, yeah. you know, if you grow if you're growing up in in the South. Uh, probably in that you know middle class a bit, or maybe a little bit below that. Trying to even get to the middle class, um, it was you know it was tough, and life was full of stumbles, and it wasn't always perfect. And you, and yeah. you, did, you know, you did have loss. And I think Lawler was really good at at being you know he was always cocky and arrogant, but occasionally would get would. I have some in black and he'd be like, Oh, I've really taken a look at myself when he dropped those matches, you know, back to back losses to Dutch Mantel clean in the middle. Uh, one of which was on his wedding day, no less. Uh, you know, he, he's like, you know, I'm 32 years old. I'm not getting any younger, which is, you know, now it's, <laughs> it's really easy to look back at those and, and laugh just because the law continues to wrestle to this day. But at the time, you know, yeah, that's, uh, that's yeah. crazy. But it's this great promo, and and the fans, you know, believed in it. Uh, and he could he could be amazingly humble sometimes. And he was saying, "I'm really taking a look yeah, at myself, but- and maybe if I don't win this Monday night, then I'll I'll call it quits." And of course, the crowd. Yeah. To 10, he 000. always had he always had sure, but he always had something going on. And look for the better part of a, for let's call it an actual match, in addition to whatever craziness was going on with an Andy Kaufman or, a, you know, if he had some, you know, boxing match against Jimmy Hart or whatever he had going on yeah. lower in the card. Yeah. He said to have some main event thing going on. Yeah. It was completely okay. separate. Yeah. Cause they couldn't, they couldn't quite put it on the same level. It had to be kind of, it had to be positioned as, as an afterthought. Although I, I would right. say, I would argue that, that Lawler and Kaufman probably drew the house um uh, in april on april, sure. april 5th 82 just because it, it they had built it so they had to build they had to build it slowly because of, because of Kaufman's schedule so but you know by the time he came back i believe he came back in march of 82 and and did the rematch so we're talking months here really uh following his his first appearance where uh you know there's this huge gap but the fans remembered and he was able to kind of keep that heat and you know he started eventually he started sending in the interviews the the uh yeah. the, the, the hygiene tips and, and all of that to keep to keep his heat and they would get so much heat that the that finally the station had to stop airing them you know he, he showed up one Saturday morning <laughs> and they were like you know he, I, I think i think the toilet paper one was the was the last one and that <laughs> 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 we, you know, fi- finally we were educated on how to use the stuff. It had, it had been right. Th- it had been right there. Uh, my mom, you know. I- 
<laughs> but so thanks to Andy for clearing that up for me. Uh, <laughs> so there's never, never was a real period where he was there every week after week, you know? No, 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 no. Uh, in but, between or months in between. You know, and, and that was the thing. Like when it when when the when the deal happened, uh, I it was a big when the when the single match was finally signed because they do a rematch with. Like I said, they when they booked the deal with uh, with Foxy for the for the second time. At that point, it, it things became uh, planned, and so they knew that Law right. was going to after Kaufman cheated or hung. I think he had hung on to a rope, maybe uh, that he was going to kind of come in and intervene and. You know, all all they needed was a shove. You know, Lawler just shoved, call, put him on his butt, and he went, you know, he went ballistic and screaming that he's going to sue. And then, <laughs> and, and I think Lawler comes out there and it, on television the next week, and he actually has a copy of a supposed lawsuit. Who knows? Who knows actually what it was? It could have been the format for that Saturday for that Saturday morning that he's huh? looking at. But he's, you know, he's like, hey, this is a joke, and you're a joke, and why don't we just settle it? You know, let's settle it in the ring, not in the courtroom, which. <laughs> Uh, if only real life worked out that way, you know, if we could, just yeah. settle it, if we could just sit on the ring, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> That's never worked out for me. Every time I've tried that. Now, I don't know what my reaction was, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. I was not able to get my uncle to take me at that point uh, to, to the matches uh, on April 5th, 82. But I, re- I remember seeing the, the pre-match hype for it. And, uh, the newspapers were all talking about it because it, and even they were fooled uh, about this. And the, there was an editorial. Uh, well, I'm getting, kind of getting ahead of myself here. But so anyway, there's there's first of all, Jack Eaton, who's the most renowned sportscaster in Memphis, uh, but also, you know, part of the Channel 5 crew at WMC TV, who also that's where the studio show was, was shot. And Memphis Wrestling was such a hot property that Big Jack would often feature the matches uh, in his Monday night sports report. Uh, and right. they would show, they would show highlights and they, and usually the main event was, was still in the ring. And if it, and if it was, then they would uh, close the show and, uh, they would even have the lead anchor Mason Granger say, you know, like, Oh, we just got the result. Done. And it made it, 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 it only, wow. added, for me, you know, as a young kid, it, it, it added to the credibility you know, oh, sure. if, it's, if it's all a silly show, then why is the sports guy, you know, why is, why is Mason Granger closing the show? Wait, wait a minute, breaking news. We, we just got <laughs> this in. Uh, Bill Dundee uh, has beaten oh. it. Week, but by disqualification, so oh. wait, world championship is not changing hands. And it was always funny because I originally, I think they even, when they first started doing this, occasionally uh, Jack or Mason would defer to Dave Brown a little bit. And Dave was... Dave appeared to be uncomfortable. <laughs> whatever, whatever they would do that. Um, I, I, because I remember there's Lawler and Bachwinkle in us in a world title versus world title match when they were trying to get the CWA title over as a major uh, championship in the sport. And Bachwinkle picks Lawler up and gives him an atomic drop and, and Eaton didn't know what to call that. And he's like, he's saying, Bachwinkle administrators say, Dave, what what is that? And Dave goes, uh, <clears throat> an, an atomic drop. <laughs> 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 and Jackie chuckles. He's like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> an atomic drop on the old king and <laughs> sends the king flying over the top rope. Um, and he would always deadpan the, the, the results. But in his pre-match interview with, with Kaufman, he goes, uh, He's like, would you like to hurt him? <laughs> and Lawler, Lawler just for one second pauses and he goes, I think I have to hurt him. And that, oh, wow. that's just absolute <laughs> gold. That is absolute yeah. gold. And, uh, and I know, I know big Jack really got a kick out of the whole thing. Uh, when, when it all unfolded and they highly, I think they showed the highlights. I mean, maybe all that week on the, on the news and it quickly picked up. Steve, yeah. what, what was your, what was your reaction, uh, to this? I, I, I was allowed to stay up that night cause this was a special night. Uh, wasn't always allowed to, but occasionally my parents would let me stay cause this was a school night and I usually had to be in bed by like nine 30 or 10 at the latest. But if it was something big, well, and, I, 
and they would let me stay up. And I saw, I remember seeing the results and they, because this wasn't the main event, Lawler and the Monk was, uh, they were, they actually had the highlights early and I got to see it and I was just blown away. And I remember like running in, I had, I was, I had a little black and white TV set set up in my room. And this is, again, it's one of those charming things of being a wrestling man, I think in the eighties, you know, I, I, I remember, I, and I couldn't quite pick up a, a great, it was like a hand me down television that, the, that I was getting. Yeah. And I had to like f- fiddle around with the, with the rabbit ears, even to kind of get it to come in perfectly. And, and, and to see Lawler, you know, give the pile drivers. And that's, you also have to understand too, that, 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 that move was, uh, even though it was Lawler's finisher, further cementing his reputation as the dirtiest baby face probably ever. Um, <laughs> you know, his finishing move is, is of course I- illegal and it was actually on the books, I think in the state of Tennessee <laughs> as being, uh, illegal. So in Memphis fans eyes, this is like uh, taking a shotgun to your opponent. Um, wow. yeah. So, uh, it was, oh, it was, yeah. it was a huge deal. So what, what was your reaction when you saw this? Well, I was, I was, Older than you were, so I don't, I don't think uh, the, uh, being able to stay up and <laughs> watch yeah. it, certainly live in upstate New York, even if I were a kid wanting to stay up to watch the results, uh, you know, uh, there were no results to be to be found. But that got publicity, I would say, the next day. If I yeah. if I said there were photos in some papers, you know, not every paper, but some national papers had picture of uh, of him, you know, pile driving Andy or Andy on the stretcher. Uh, I think uh, before too long, uh, they had Andy on Saturday Night Live and uh, Brian Doyle Murray. I think mm. uh, did a did an opening where he let into right. the footage and he talked about it. And then he started showing up long before he ever did Letterman. He showed up places with the uh, with the uh, neck brace on uh but i i think that might have seen clips maybe on george michael's sports machine which used to be on nbc's on the weekend he would always have a little feature about wrestling if he had something some cool pitch to add to it and back then you were so starved for any information as a as a fan especially growing up watching www tv instead of wild memphis tv <laughs> You were really intrigued if you got to see even a couple of seconds of footage from anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to think if I was aware of the match until until the result. You know, if they if they were promoting it on various TV shows, or if Andy was making appearances up here before he went to Memphis. I don't think so. I think it might have taken me by not completely by surprise. But just to see that footage and stuff, because by then he had started wrestling women uh, in more high profile things and, uh, and things that were on TV. He did it on Saturday Night Live where he had a, a, a sort of an out of it Buddy mm-hmm. Rogers yeah. as like his spokesman and manager. And I'm not sure of the timeline, but I would say that was that had to have been before yeah. him and Lawler. Uh, so people were aware that he was doing things like that. So then to, to see on a news show or, or picture in a newspaper, oh, well, it was definitely it was a comedian from 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 uh, Taxi, Andy Kaufman, you see on Saturday Night Live, and he got hurt, taken to the hospital. And all of a sudden, now, not for a second, but that I'm probably in high school or, or, or what year was it again? Uh, that was 80, 80, 82, April 5th, 1982 was the, okay. yeah. so yeah, so no, but so I'm not even in, you know, past high school at that point. So no, not for a second did I think, oh my God, he, well, there is a thing where you see that report and you say, yeah, maybe something really did go wrong and <laughs> he got his neck broke. <laughs> He's just that stupid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you don't exactly, especially then, that the world wasn't the world of wrestling wasn't just common knowledge to everybody. So you kind of did see that and it would blow your mind. One, because you wanted to see any footage from outside your area. Uh, and two, an event that's crazy where you go, like I was sort of certainly aware of Lawler. I don't know if I'd seen much of his wrestling or anything at that point, but um, yeah, it was just, the thing was completely wild and intriguing. 
And yeah, there was a thing where you go, "Did you really get her?" <laughs> yeah. So okay. So so so, so, so it made you think about it, every it, single show <laughs> with the, the neck brace on. You go, "Oh well, okay." Now he's just conning around. I will say though that I mean, talk about dedication and commitment to to which is everything that Cave Fabe stood for back then. I mean, it was a commitment. It was a tacit, uh, kind of a tacit understanding that you didn't, you didn't reveal anything to anybody. And not that they even necessarily had to sit Andy down and, and explain this and and go. Okay, I think they had, they just had the feeling uh, of how much he respected the business. You know, always referring to to Jerry as Mr. Lawler, and Lawler would protest. Right. <laughs> Andy, please just call me Jerry. <laughs> and finally, like I think, I think Lawler just gave up, you know, and just because Andy was just always, you know, not always Mr. Lawler, Mr. Jarrett, Mr. Coffee, you know, all the guys, all the all the faces of Memphis wrestling. It was always, you know, mm-hmm. he was humbled to be there. Um, and you're, but for so, six months, you know, for six, six months he went everywhere wearing the neck brace, right? Uh, which was great, but. Like I say, as a little bit older fan, that never really, you know, that's when you would see him showing up everywhere, and you know, he was trying to, he was trying to be deadly serious, but there was always, uh, you know, there was always some laughter uh, going on where you go, oh well, he's just, he's out of his mind, you know, he's so funny, but um, yeah, it, it, it uh, well, he, you know, another, I, so supposedly, you know, Paul Bosch sent the. The telegram, uh, yeah. I, I think that that's been determined to be legit, that he sent the telegram congratulating Lawler for standing up for the business. So, and I don't, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine um, a seasoned veteran being fooled that way. And and Jarrett says that he recalls Bill Watts being fooled by it. And we have, you know, there's been the Mid-South footage that's surfaced, and I, I think I even put it on either my Facebook page or definitely on my Facebook page and maybe YouTube, where Bill Watts is, is talking about it to the Mid-South audience as and <laughs> goes on this long tirade about, oh, you know how – People always after your job and try, you know, and this guy from Hollywood comes down and he's taking a spot on the card. He's taking it away from a deserving wrestler and uh, Jerry Lawler, <laughs> you know, a real tough hombre, <laughs> 254 wow. pounds, which uh, <laughs> Lawler was always like about 220, 224, 234. I think he was billed as 234 and, and weighed in probably at 224. Uh, but, uh, and, and if you didn't know better, uh, what seemed to really buy into to the uh, to the whole thing? Uh, at least I wonder if they, they they buy into part of it. Like like I was saying, uh, Watts probably thought the whole thing was a work, but probably thought the guy was so stupid that he got his neck broken and good. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe because they were like he probably realized. Well, Jared's too cheap to pay for for an ambulance, <laughs> so. <laughs> it must have oh, been. Oh, you know that all had to be going through their mind. Oh my God! Well, they were, you know it was. Uh, you know, Andy kept insisting, and Lawler was like, "Fine." He could, you know, relaying messages back and forth with Calhoun, the referee, and saying, "Fine, he can do the ambulance, but you know, he's going to have to pay for it. We're not paying for it." And uh, you know, <laughs> Calhoun would go over there and tell that to Kaufman, and they're so, you know. Uh, I, it, that's one of the things that Lawler told me oh, when I broke in as a referee. He goes, you know, occasionally the referees will, will, will communicate things to you that they're going to do next. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> oh, man, I felt so much pressure at, the, at that point. About seconds away wow. from my from my debut, and Lawler's pulled me aside to tell me that, oh, they're going to be calling spots like through me, which certainly makes sense. Uh, but I, I did not mm-hmm. know that. Time. I thought I thought I was this real smart fan, but I even I didn't know didn't know that. Mm. But uh, of course, why wouldn't they? That's how they're, they're it, it, one way to help the to keep the illusion and for it to flow perfectly. And he goes, oh, and if you see a guy not who who's not wrenching down on a hold, you know, tell him like, hey, you know, you're showing light here. And I'm like, oh, wait, God, I can't I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm supposed to tell Jeff Gaylord, it's big muscle head gorilla. <laughs> Hey man, that looks like shit. Come on, come on, lay it in there. Gotta kill me. But <laughs> wow, 
<laughs> oh, so yeah, I I uh, I thought that Lawler had, had really just about killed the guy. And again, we didn't see Andy for for the longest time. He shows up, I think, once at the at the Mid South Coliseum unannounced, um, and the Dream Machine's in the ring about to have a Southern Heavyweight Title match, and. He's, he's talking to say, I'll come back to Memphis and I'm going to wrestle women. And that, and if any woman can pin me, not only will she get the $500 I promised originally, I'll double that to a thousand and she can marry me. <laughs> yes. It's my hand in marriage. The ultimate prize. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, wow. Yes. And, of course, the face put him out of the building, and then I—I uh, don't think he—I don't think we even saw him again until which which made the finish uh, to the Nick Bockwinkel match in January of '83 uh, so compelling. You know, he he did have he did have uh, uh, well actually I'm getting ahead of myself. So so Lawler uh, puts Jimmy Hart. He has a, a dream match with Jimmy Hart to close out 1982. We haven't seen Kaufman in, in in months except for maybe that one appearance where he shows up unannounced and and offers his hand so to marriage. He, so after he went out on the stretcher, nothing until no, not really. Sucked. You know, maybe some, maybe a couple oh, that of, whole year. Yeah, so pretty much he he was he was gone, and even then, even when when he's out there with. Uh, with uh, Brian Murray Doyle or Doyle Murphy, uh, Murray uh, showing the clips from Memphis. Uh, he seemed he's, he's dialing it back and he's almost, he's very apologetic. And yeah, he's saying, yeah. yeah. He says, I, I thought it was, I thought it was all made up and I found out it was real. Yeah. And I, yeah. I don't, I don't know if there was any plans to continue it at that point and, and how it got to where he would come back in January of, of 83 and do this. But uh, Lawler closes out 82 with a dream match with Hart, one-on-one in a cage. He power drives him several times, uh, burns with fire, and it Hart's just finished. Uh, and to close out the year, they uh, they draw 10,000, uh, almost 11,000 people at the South Coliseum. Lawler's first world title shot – since his return from the broken leg, so they've gone. They've gone virtually two years with uh, with no world champion on the card, which is just really amazing that they were able to draw those kind of houses. But eventually, yeah, you know, some of the personal heat starts dying down a little bit, and so they decide to go that direction. Uh, first, they bring in Flair uh, earlier that year, and he and Lawler have the the inconclusive finish. But raises right. questions over over who's the better wrestler, uh, and, and, and brilliant you kind know, of Flair, really, uh, because he. I've talked about this before. Oh, yeah. Some it's some of the better because Flair is not made to look like a wuss. He actually has Lawler trapped in the figure four and ready to, you know, maybe have Lawler submit when the original ten minutes expires and they do the overtime and uh, Lawler has a chance to recover because Flair's let go of the figure. For and then Flair scoops up and says, "I don't need any more of this," which was probably a smart thing to do. So he didn't come off that badly in it. Um, and you compare that to how he's booked everywhere else, and uh, it's—I thought, I thought it was a brilliant piece of television. Um, but I, I guess they have—you know—it's the same old thing. They have trouble getting a return date on Flair, uh, which leads to some animosity with Jarrett and Flair down the road because Flair never got his payoff for that. Um, but they decided to go back with Bockwinkle just because he's, he's he's a proven commodity. He and Lawler have unbelievable chemistry together. Um, sure. And, you know, they build up to a world title match when when Bockwinkle has the Southern belt and the AWA and the AWA world title. Um, Lawler puts up his hair, wins that, wins the blow off and then sets it up for this December day. And Lawler appears to win it. And they position it in Memphis that they, as if he's truly won the world championship. They don't give any hint to a controversy or anything like that until the following week when they say that uh, Nick is not going to show up for the rematch if Lawler wears the belt to, to the ring. And Lawler is even wrestling TV that Saturday after he's been on the road supposedly for a week. Um, and he says, yeah, well, this morning I had to turn the belt over to to referee Paul Morton, and he is going to carry the belt. Now, while you would trust and trust <laughs> the World's Heavyweight Championship platter, this turkey platter-sized belt, uh, uh, with all these supposed gold rubies and diamonds, turn it over to this frail referee <laughs> for, the, for the next 40, for the next forty eight hours. He'll keep an eye on it. Uh, and when and when the mat, before the match starts, uh, you know, Bogwinkle says he he doesn't he doesn't he cannot he will not show up for the rematch if I'm wearing the belt to the ring. And so I I told him I said, look, I just want to get this over with. 
that's fine because I'll be the one wearing it on the way out of the ring. So you so you can't so there are no photos of Lawler wearing the belt or anything like that, uh, which is probably a smart move to cover their track. Um, <laughs> yeah. And 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 Hart shows up uh, that night wrapped in. You think it's Jimmy Hart, but he's got the Invisible Man bandages all over his face. He's wrapped head to toe like a mummy, and he's he's even got the sunglasses over his eyelids, <laughs> which is just classic. And yep. you know they do the deal, and he gets away from you know Lawler gets Dundee down there to sit ringside uh, to make sure that Hart doesn't interfere in the match. And you know they do a kind of whole knockout in the middle of the ring, and Lawler goes to cover Bockwinkle, and at that point Hart. Gets out, gets away from Dundee's, is trying to distract Paul Morton, which is not, you know, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, Morton, Morton has his back turned while Lawler has an obvious three count. And here comes real Jimmy Hart with no bandages down to the ringside area to distract Lawler and makes him fair game for a quick schoolboy and uh, with a yank of the trunks, I might add. Uh, yeah. And Paul Morton counts three and they take the, and there is so much heat when they, when they start to unravel. This uh, this crazed mummy at ringside who you could have sworn was Jimmy Hart, dressed just like Jimmy Hart, and you could even hear some fans going, "That's Andy Kaufman, that's Andy Kaufman." Oh yeah, and, yeah. Oh my gosh! And you have to remember, this is this has been the dream of Memphis wrestling fans for so long, and the way they portrayed it, it was a title right. switch, and and Andy Kaufman has has done this, and. And law and Andy is going back. You can see the fans kind of converging a little bit as Coffin's going down wow. the down the aisle, and Lawler's kind of kind of chasing him back there as well, because uh, this is this was a dream, and he's burst burst the bubble. And I, I remember just being absolutely crushed. This is one of those where uh, they didn't have the result uh, by the time the news went off the air, so I had to wait till the next morning. Wow. It said the headline said Bockwinkle and friends win, and I just oh. Uh, my heart just my heart just sank, Scott. Wow. <laughs> it was like Lawler throwing uh Jimmy Hart's gold record for keep on dancing into the Mississippi River. It just <laughs> kind of whirled around and slowly burst and then just cascaded down and <laughs> till it <finally> disappeared. Uh, <laughs> so I could wait for Lawler to get his hands on Andy, which uh he would not do. And this is the this is the thing, you know. That's this was this was in January of eighty three. And Kaufman didn't come back. He eventually comes back. Uh, I think it's a, the last week of April or maybe the first week in May. He comes back Colossus of Death, uh, which is probably, I guess, the second most widely viewed match because it was included on one of the after tapes that they did. Uh, yeah. With the Lords of the Ring. Uh, and they have poor, like, yeah, poor Duke like, Myers it, squeezed into one of Lawler's oh, old. Oh, Duke Myers. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, squeezed into one of his old, uh, some of his Lawler's old uh, tights and trunks that he used to wear, and a and a sweater that was about uh, this big uh, woolly uh, turtleneck sweater <laughs> to be about two sizes too small. So his his trademark belly, you know, Dick Myers has had one of those bodies. I don't care if you put him in a burlap sack, you know, you, you can tell who was underneath. <laughs> That thing, uh, it was just ridiculous. But they drew about ten. They that was the biggest crowd that Andy Kaufman drew at the Mid South Coliseum, uh, a little over ten thousand people to, wow. to see Lawler finally finally get his revenge. But you know, months had gone by since then, and so it's a real credit to to Kaufman that he was able to keep his heat for that long in between appearances. Yeah, if he if he the way he's laid it out, I mean. The, the, the myth is that, yeah, he was there all the time, and people say, oh, my God, he's still down there in Memphis doing this crazy thing. It, and he was ac- actually almost completely absent for all of 82, except for those really key, huge appearances. Yeah. And then, and so this is when he actually starts showing up a little more regularly, where he's managing other people. And even, didn't he make some of the other towns, like uh, like Nashville? Yeah, he did. Yeah, that was that that, that. that was that. Some oh, and we're we're also kind of we're we're skipping over sort of. Uh, I think one of the most talented, uh, or probably not one of the most talented, but one of the most entertaining aspects of the whole of the whole program between Lawler and Kaufman was the meeting on the David Letterman show. Uh, oh my gosh! Yeah, you know, and that was sort of the. I guess that was sort of the stop gap. You know, they couldn't get Andy uh, into into Memphis uh, d- during the fall of '82. 
Um, and so this was sort of, and at that point, it's kind of, it's kind of like, okay, is this going to be the end of it? Because Andy has been, you know, apologizing for his, his appearances on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> um, and the whole, the whole deal with the show, uh, when the producers put this together, Andy was a very, very apologetic about, about how things went down and they get Andy to agree to come on David Letterman to kind of tie this all up. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and the original plan was that, that Andy and Lawler were going to join arm in arm and sing all you need is love. <laughs> <laughs> which I song, which, which oddly enough was, uh, was played at my own wedding. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> wow. yeah, so maybe on, a, maybe on a subconscious level, I was trying to, uh, go back to those, those wonderful days. Um, and knowing what the, yeah. what the original plan was. Uh, but I think, and thank gosh, thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the same thing. I was uh, super into, into watching Andy Kaufman, whatever he would do on Letterman. And he was still hammering this, this business of, uh, of the injury that he got from Jerry Lawler. Yeah. And then they show up on Letterman and Letterman's show was, such a cool hip show to be watching at that time. And uh, Letterman has even said um, he loves having Andy on even when stuff went really weird and way off the rails because he just said that uh, he always had something really unusual, bizarre, and special prepared uh, for his appearances. So it was always... So they... He did some really crazy stuff on Letterman's morning show. It wasn't even related to where he kind of showed up and it was like out of it and homeless. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, that, and in the midst of all of that, you think of what was going on, just a brief sidebar on Andy. All during this period, yeah, there were things like that uh, where he shows up. Some of this is prior to the, to the wrestling stuff, you know, uh, where he disrupts the Friday show. And, uh, yeah, he, he was, he was getting quite a reputation for, for these very, uh, very bizarre, uh, late night television appearances, but Letterman was all in on all that stuff but there again is somebody who, who was a big wrestling fan, but didn't get to see much stuff from Memphis or much stuff out of the area at that time. He's probably just starting to see different things come in through cable and so on. Uh, that was a, a big deal to, to the law who was going to be given this forum, you know, who was going to appear on a national show like that. Yeah. And I, Lawler said, you know, he wasn't crazy about the idea uh, of apologizing, but he was like, Hey, you know, whatever, anything, anything to, he was not going to turn down an appearance to be on the Letterman sure. show, which, which really, yeah, you mentioned that cool factor. Uh, the Letterman show was still in its infancy, really. I, I think it, it had been on less than a year, I think, at that point. Mm, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So so that sort of adds to uh, – you can see how uncomfortable Dave gets as this starts to unfold. And uh, I, I, there's a noticeable shift in tone, I think, when, when Letterman asks uh, Lawler. He's like, well, you know, he's he said that he's – He's sorry, or do you, do you accept his apology? And Lawler goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, Andy, Andy pitched to Lawler the night before. He goes, you know, I know what we're supposed to do. Um, they go out there and say, but what, what if we did something different? And Lawler's, and this is just, you know, the night before, uh, I, I kind of equate it to guys talking about a finish, you know, in, in the back and uh, kind of going over yeah. some different things. Like, well, what if we did this instead? And, and he's like, well, what if you slap me? And Lawler says that he was just <laughs> like, oh, gosh, Andy, you know, I'll probably get arrested and they won't even hear the thing. I, I don't I don't think so. I, I and, and and so yeah. they, but they kind of, but they didn't really, you know, as Lawler said, they talked a few more minutes and they said, well, let's, let's just see how it how it on how it goes. So in other words, they're going to call it in the ring. Uh <laughs> So to speak, because uh, Lawler says, he goes, you know, I didn't quite know. He said, but I knew I, I, I could just tell the way it was the way that things were going back and forth um, that I knew where Andy wanted to take it. And they had the one break. And his Lawler says, you know, it 
I knew that we were about to go to a second one and I knew that it was now or never. And the, the microphone kind of shifts back to, to Andy and he starts going into this thing. He's like, you know, this is just because I, I'm from the North and I was a Yankee and there's, you know, there's so much white trash in the South. And that's when Lawler, you know, who's wearing, you know, the, the, the black members only is like a, a high oh, end oh, yeah. members only jacket. That's kind of zipped down to, to the to the bottom, and not many people can get away with that look. Uh, but the king can certainly, yeah. <laughs> can certainly pull it off, and he's got the red pants, which matched his attire for the April fifth uh, eighty two bout earlier that year, when Lawler's got oh, you know the the black singlet and the black uh, trunks and the red tights and the black boots. Lawler's he's got like the the street version of that outfit <laughs> that he's wearing yeah. on the air. You know the red other pants. Um, you know. Typically worn by hookers in New York City at the time, um, and the and the black yeah, jacket. Yeah, people in New York looking at that. You know, some of your urban centers looking at uh, Lawler dressed like that, going, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> oh boy! But it was like you know, it was like a rock star or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. Lawler ends up, you know, he could tell, he goes, well, it's it's either it's we're going to do this or we're, or we're not. And Andy, when Andy mm-hmm. starts talk, going to that little thing where he's talking under his breath and talking about, oh, you know, it's just because I, I'm from the north. I'm a Yankee and I've heard this from so many people in the south, you know, which just let's face it. There's so much white trash. I think he says the words white trash. And I think that's the go ahead for Lawler. Like, OK, mm-hmm. OK. Yeah. So I think if you say something about me, but now you're talking about my people in the South. And so he gets a rearranges his jacket and just, oh my gosh, absolutely slaps the hell out of Kaufman. And Andy has no, you know, mm-hmm. he, that bump that he takes, it's really slow. I mean, if, I mean, the hardest thing you can take in wrestling is that open ended slap because there's no way to, yeah. no way to pull back on it. I took, I took one from Miss Texas. I took one from downtown Bruno and after each of them, <laughs> I swear to you, I could not, I couldn't eat anything for the next couple of days. And the one that Lawler yeah. connected with, it sounded like a gunshot. And Andy slowly falls yeah. out of his chair. And, and Letterman, it's weird. Today he says that he was clued in on it. Uh, I don't believe it. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think so either. And, and he, he even said it in an interview with GQ years ago. I mean, I think in 84, 85, that... He he had no idea of what was going to happen, and that he envisioned that was the first and only time that he he felt like he had lost control of a show and that the crowd was going to riot. And wow, yeah, and and and, and, and but I saw an interview I think uh, from like two years ago um, where he was claiming that that he knew all along what was going to happen, and I honestly, I mean, if so, he did a brilliant job of selling it because. <laughs> And he reacts about the way I thought he would. <laughs> yep. And yep. you watch it now, you go, that, that, I don't know. Yeah, he's, he's shifting Not the paper. Not acting chops. But <laughs> and when Andy comes out there with the cursing and just, oh, my gosh, and they have the cuckoos bleeping it out. It's yep. it's, it's so perfect. It's just it, – it probably would not have gone that way even if, if they had planned that. It, there's there's I think it's just one of those wonderful things. It's so in that in that sense it was very much like a like a Memphis wrestling angle. You know, like you sort of they sort of give you a direction with it. And this is this was even when I was in the business between you know, we didn't when I turned heel on Lawler, that was decided about twenty minutes before we went out for the main event. And I'd sort of planted that seed with wow. with Eddie with Eddie Gilbert and he decided it. But even then it was like everything that unfolded afterward, it was all uh, uh, improv, you know, and them kind of whispering yeah. to me, Lawler wants you to go back out there and then shove him. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, he, Lawler ends up taking this big bump on his ass. I had none, I had no idea any of that was gonna, uh, gonna happen. Uh, and it's just, it's very reminiscent of, uh, it's very Memphis like how it, how it all unfolded. And you could argue that it would, it wouldn't have worked and, and been remembered. I think, uh, Variety says it's one of the top 30 TV moments of, of all time, just ahead of the right. OG Simpson ambulance chase. So <laughs> <laughs> it was another improvised move that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that no, well, that, thinking about that again, is, is Kaufman sort of 
improvisational skills, how far out there he was, and his willingness to take things far beyond. I mean, he was working on a different level than than, than simple comedy. Uh, he could take it to such a to such a wild level and wanted to and wanted to to do stuff that would provoke reactions other than laughter. To think how perfect it was that he ended up doing that with Lawler and Memphis, you know, the, the, the absolute perfect marriage. Uh, I don't know. If, I wonder if what he thought, because I mean, he grew up watching Buddy Rogers and WWS stuff, and, and I don't know if he ever had any uh, exposure or access to to the crazy kind of Memphis stuff that he found himself thrown into, but how that all worked out, like I said, uh, was was really perfect. <laughs> I, I would love I would have loved to have been there the night that he was in Nashville because in my experiences that was one of the rowdier stops where the fans mm-hmm. it, I mean oh boy even even in ninety six it or ninety ninety five and ninety six when I was a heel going through the the territory Nashville was one of those towns that was that was the town I got a switchblade pulled on me you know and this okay. is years yeah this is years after uh, Vince's you know, come out and said that it's all predetermined. Uh, right. Lawler's appearing on WWE as a heel, but working Memphis as a, as a baby face, which is, you know, it was all kind of confusing, I think for, for, for some fans and, and kind of, kind of hurt the credit credibility probably of, of Lawler and the promotion a little bit. Um, mm. But even still fans, seriously, but they would still check their disbelief at the door. Cause we, we never let on, you know, what everything that, I mean, I never, I was never friendly to the fans. I was always in character. Uh, some of them would try to, uh, they, they thought some of my one-liners were funny and they would try to cheer me and I would turn on them. I mean, I would just, because that's, that's, that's yeah. what I was, that's what I was taught to do. And so, because right. we, we took it to that level, uh, the fans responded in kind. And so I got to experience that on a, you know, I, I kind of talk about that moment where the, where the guy pulled, you know, he pulled that switchblade and looked at me and and was like i'm gonna get you in the parking lot and of course oh, i was reach, yeah but i look at i, I look back on it I, it's it's almost I, I think i'm bragging about that because yeah it, I, it was something yeah. i didn't expect and i was like god these people these, i mean i this is this is a little bit a little bit i'm not going to compare myself to heart but it's a little taste of maybe what heart got to experience um oh yeah yeah. And knowing, knowing those fans in Nashville, it's a wonder that Kaufman made it out of their life. And I even kind of wonder, you know, if he really realized uh, just how much he was getting. <laughs> and if anybody told yeah. him to dial, dial it down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do? Do you remember what the match was in, in Nashville? Um, uh, it, it was I think it was a D, I think it was Kaufman, maybe Man Mountain Link. This time playing the Colossus of Death role, yeah, against <laughs> against Lawler. I think I think that was the deal. But they, you know, they yeah. had made a big, made a big deal on the on the local news about it, and they sold out the Nashville Sports Arena. And yeah, it was it was it was heated. It was really heated. I, and I would, I would I, you're right. I I would love to because Andy unfortunately passed away. Uh, short, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, died so young. Uh, still kept coming to Memphis, and, and I can tell you the the exact moment that the whole thing kind of went up in smoke, really. And it's mm-hmm. no pun intended, but it was the moment. It was the moment that Lawler burned Andy with fire on Memphis television in in eighty. Really? Yeah, I I think that's that's when fans. It was a great it was a great deal, you know. Uh, but Kauf, that's when Kauf, I guess Coffin that summer was you know had some had some open dates. I think the ratings were falling on Taxi. It might have even been canceled at that point. I'm not sure. Uh, mm-hmm. But Andy suddenly starts appearing more often in the studio, and they even do a deal where uh, Andy turns baby face and has a brief feud with Hart, which is one of the funniest studio brawls you're ever going to see because they're both throwing these wild oh, yeah. swings and I don't think a single one connects. <laughs> <laughs> and and then Mr. Coffee and, and God bless, the late Eddie Marlin who recently passed away, God bless Eddie. Uh, you know, Mr. Coffee and Eddie Marlin come out to break it up. They don't even send the wrestlers from the back. They send Coffee <laughs> <laughs> and Marlin to, to, to break them up. And, and when 
uh, Andy, Andy Marlin's got a hold of Andy, and Andy's still throwing the punches, and Hart's like, you know, I think Andy halfway connects with a slap, and and Hart's like, you're not gonna slap me in my hometown. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's a little tentative. A, a lot of things where he, 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 he's about to slap him, and he just sort of gives a little pussy. You know, jab. Yeah, well, I think he hits half of Lance's microphone, and then <laughs> that kind of shields the blow, and then he kind of catches Hart a little bit. And then Hart does that where he's like borderline, you know, screaming and crying. No one's going to slap me in my hometown. And then they start throwing these wild swings. None of them even land. And anyway, he gives Lawler a check. Uh, you know, the, the amount that he promised any wrestler who could put Lawler out with a pile driver and injure him and put him in the hospital, gives him the check for $5,000, a little apropos and, uh, says, you know, if you'll, if you'll be my partner, because if I turn on you, then, then you'll have that $5,000. Uh, so in effect, he's paying Lawler. He's setting Lawler up with the, with the very same blood money that he promised everybody else. And Lawler agrees to be his partner. And of course, Against uh, Jimmy Hart, one of the assassins, who I guess was Roger Smith or or uh, uh, Donnie Bass, and mm-hmm. you know, as soon as the match starts, Lawler goes in there, and then Andy comes in with the powder and turns heel on him, and they attempt to lay Lawler out, put him out, and Lawler comes out on TV the next week in a neck brace, but he rips it off, and he's like, "I'm not a pencil neck geek like you, and I'll get my revenge," and da 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 da, and then uh, later, I think in the very same show, Coffin's got a makeshift crown that they've made, where he's the new king of wrestling, and Lawler comes up behind him and throws the fireball, and I think after oh. after that, like Lawler kind of looked a little goofy, trusting Kaufman. And then yeah. when, he takes, when, he, when he takes the fireball, even though that's still uh, one of those things where the Memphis fans didn't quite know how it was done and, and it always got a big reaction and the crowd there live pot for it. I think at that point, people realize this is just another part of, part of the show. Yeah. And, like, and, it, and another thing is that at that point, uh, nationally, people are starting to not pay attention anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Like like him getting burned with a fireball got no national uh, intervention to anybody. They were just kind of is he still doing that stuff? Well, good for yeah. him. Yeah, <laughs> it kept, yeah it went from being this kind of weird uh, uh, Hollywood quirk almost, and and why is he involved in this? And oh man, it took a dangerous turn. And then the letter, yeah, I think it, you know it really kind of uh, maybe peaked with the with the Letterman appearance. Yeah. And then I think that's when they decided sure. to go a little bit further with it. And that's, you know, when they brought Andy in in early 83, had, Lawler, had him screw Lawler out of the world title. Um, and then he comes, you know, they had that appearance, the rematch finally with uh, Colossus of Death. It draws 10,000. At that point, it 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 was over. Um, mm-hmm. And but they. Now he had a, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, well he yeah. had a little run there. At one point, and I don't know if it was then or it was after the fireball or something, where he's bringing in hired guns to take care of all. Or he brings in, a, he manages Ken Patera, he right. manages uh, uh, Apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and did that last very long, or was that just a, a sort of a stopgap thing in between? Well, uh, well that, that was that was kind of, that was sort of a stopgap. That was in uh, uh, spring of '83 when they brought in uh, uh, Ke- uh, Patera, and that was that was how yeah. Lawler got got the got the match with with uh, with Coffin to begin with with the Colossus of Death. Lawler had to beat Ken Patera uh, to, okay. to to get the shot. But yeah, they because they, Patera had the swinging neck breaker. Right. And and that was yeah. gonna be that was gonna be the hold that took that took Lawler out. Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, that's sort of I even went to one of Lawler's softball games. Uh <laughs> he, he was having one of those softball I was bugging the I was bugging the hell out of him. And then poor Robert Reed, who was one of Lawler's buddies, who like all, like half the half the jobs half the job guys in Memphis at one point were all of Lawler's old uh, football buddies or people he'd gone to school with. And poor Robert yeah. Reed was a buddy of Lawler's on a softball team. And, uh, you know, even though he did get the CWA world title win with Robert, with uh, Ken Raper over the assassins with the help of the fabulous ones, he was pretty much a, a, ah. you know, a, a, a jabroni, a good looking guy, kind of muscular, but uh, yeah. nowhere in the, nowhere in the, in the neighborhood of, of a true Memphis wrestling star. And the, I just remember my friends and I, we were just, 
teasing <laughs> poor Robert Reed unmercifully during that softball game. But uh, but I was asking Lawler like, you know, oh if you get if you're gonna pin Patera, you're gonna get a hold of Kaufman. He's like, yeah, you bet. That's 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 what I'm going for. And I'm like, all right, King, and we're doing like, oh <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> It's so, wow. so funny, but uh, yeah, and unfortunately, they kept trying to bring Andy in. Um, you know, his final appearance on the Jerry Lawler show. Gosh, he's even it's uh, it's sad to watch now, but he's 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 even coughing uh, through some of that. I think at that point he knew uh, just how sick he was. He knew that he mm-hmm. was dying, but he was still coming back to Memphis. And if anything, you know, I'm not. I'm, and when I say that 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 the angle had, had really kind of puttered out at that. It really got more traction than it than it ever could hope to, given Kaufman's limited appearances. Uh, you know, he started to get the started to get the a lot of his heat back with the with the hygiene tips, but they had to pull the plug on those because it was a little too much. <laughs> Uh, and so with all these obstacles, the fact that he was even to keep it going this long, and really the only reason that it that it that it petered out probably quicker than it should have was because some typical Memphis stuff where it kind of went over the line a little bit with with uh, the hit, with the switching back and forth, the fact that Lawler was fooled, that Kaufman had had, had seen the light and was right. kind of made to look like uh, look a little dopey, and then responds with the fireball. And I think that's when fans just kind of wrote it off, and they maybe even felt a little betrayed because they they really thought that this was something, this was dangerous. You know, this had a real sense of danger to it uh, that that Kaufman mm-hmm. was really putting his life at risk getting in there with, with Jerry. And this was, this was something that was not scripted. And I think that's, that's where they really got the, the imagination of the casual fan because they had the, the five or 6,000 hardcores who would come every Monday night. But then when you got up there with, when things got really cooking, 8,000 fans, 9,000, that's when they really yeah. bought into uh, the personal nature of a feud. And they really thought that somebody uh, was going to get hurt. <laughs> and with Kaufman, oh, yeah. this was tailor made for that because he was he was viewed as an outsider, and, and everything he did in the ring came off kind of awkward. And so fans really thought that this was this was the real deal. Um, wow! And, it, and it's a, and it's a shame it kind of it went out the way it did. I think the last match was a boxing match with with Andy and Lawler, and it uh, or, or maybe a handicap match against Hart and Kaufman, but it drew about. Um, 3,500 fans. And uh, yeah. And then I think, uh, gosh, five months later, uh, Andy, Andy had passed away. So uh, it, uh, unfortunately it was, it was, it was a sad close, but absolutely one of those classic Memphis moments. And I think when Jerry Jarrett talks about it, you mentioned that it's kind of funny. I had not heard that, that, that he likes to stress that that was always like a little added thing. It was an afterthought. Um, but he says that uh, he says if you say uh, you can see it by the end, they can thirty five hundred. And I don't know if he's specifically referring to that match, but he would say, "Well, he said I put the blame on myself for that because I wouldn't consider that the main event. So if the main event is Lawler versus Dutch and mm-hmm. Andy Kaufman underneath, they drew thirty five hundred. He said then the blame is on me for putting on a main event that the audience didn't want to see. Yeah." Uh, which uh, that's, that's I hadn't heard that take, uh, yeah. but uh, that's pretty interesting too. Uh, I mean, I can understand it, how much how much publicity and how much uh, how much attention they got when they had him and the thing was hot. So uh, I, I can see in the middle of it, you're even near the end, you're going, well, how can we recapture the magic? I wonder if there was some point where well. Like you say, he was on the Lawler show when he was clearly already sick. Mm. It didn't last much longer after that. But I wonder if you know they had to have the talk with him. Like you know, I think you're you're done here now. You know. Well, I I think well, I think, I, I think frequently. yeah I I think after the, I think after the Lawler show, Andy let them know that that he that he was oh, yeah not not dying. I don't think they knew that, but they knew that that he that he was in bad shape. Uh, and that he didn't know when it, when it would be back again. So, um, and then Lawler is kind of put into position when when Andy passes. You know, they have to address it on the air. And 
you can just tell that that Lawler is is conflicted and is you know it, his facial expressions he looks he looks uncomfortable for for Jerry Lawler on Memphis TV who's just you know always seemed so natural and rarely mm-hmm. thinks about what he's going to say before he goes out there and does it. Uh, he for the good of the business you know uh, he has to say you know well people keep asking me I've had a lot of phone calls. You know, what do I think about Andy Kaufman? And, um, you know, my experience is he, let's face it, he was always a jerk. Um, so, you know, but my, but I was also, you know, and I love this. It's, it's one of those classic sudden things, you know, but my mother always taught me growing up, you know, don't, don't talk ill about the dead. So, um, I can't really say too much, you know, and so he's, so he's off the hook at that point because Lawler's going to take the high road. (laughs) 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 <laughs> and not say anything and that um it closes it closes on a very somber note uh, uh and it's very telling too that that after all those appearances um uh, i never i never got and i think i did want to see the pile driver that match that the, the when Lola finally gets his hands on him uh in april of 82 yeah i think that's the only one i asked my uncle to take me to so uh, there you go. And, and after, after Lawler definitely had the book when he brings Kaufman in that last time. And then he relinquishes it to Jarrett. Um, and December, I think maybe right after that card <laughs> and they shift directions. They immediately start. And they, that's when they bring in Jerry, uh, Jerry, Jerry Jarrett brings in Randy Savage, makes that deal. And Lawler wow. starts. Uh, yeah. And then, and then brings in Bockwinkle in January of 84 and the houses go back up. I mean, I was there for one. Of, I think it was one of the best Lawler Bockwinkle matches I've ever seen on January first, eighty four. Um, mm-hmm. And they went about forty minutes and drew about eight thousand people, nine thousand people. And it's just a, it, but but a, a definite shift in direction, which is, which was sure. the, the which is the whole idea behind the Lawler and Jarrett partnership with the book. Uh, you know, and when Jarrett had it, he would get a lot of help from. From Dundee, uh, Dutch Mantel, whoever wanted to come to his booking meetings, he would have a, an open door for any guys who wanted to come. But d- with the exception of Dundee and Mantel, a lot of guys didn't. Uh, it was just uh, th- those were the two mainstays who wanted wanted to learn. And after yeah. you know, Lawler got all this stuff out of his system with Kaufman, and that they milked it for every last bit of publicity he he could get out of it. Uh, Jarrett took it back, yeah. and they got back toward a wrestling. Uh, centric uh, direction with bringing in a world champion and having Lawler knock off uh, contenders in the AWA to to get to be, uh, to get to uh, Nick wow. Nick Bockwinkle, who is, is probably his my my favorite opponent for Lawler. Well, hey Scott, I appreciate you coming in and and bringing your unique perspective because you were a fan of Andy's uh, before he even stepped into a ring in Memphis. Uh, so I really appreciate mm-hmm. you coming in. And help us and help oh, us out. Thank you very much. You reminded me a lot of stuff that I had forgotten along the way in the timeline. Yeah. When you asked me, I said to myself, "Here I come to save the day." <laughs> <laughs> and thank God you answered the call, my friend. Uh, thank you very I, much. I appreciate it, uh, everyone. That's uh, Scott Cornish, who uh, a lot of you know from the Six Hundred Five Super Podcast, uh, has hot dog and. The wrestling humor. So, although I think I've always felt like that, that sort of, I, I think, you know, this like Andy didn't like being called a comedian. I've always thought of you as the song and dance man. <laughs> <laughs> of the Me too. Absolutely. <laughs> so we'll have to, we'll have to work on that. See if we can get that over the song and dance man of the Arcadian Vanguard podcast network, Scott Cornish. Sounds, sounds like a winner, man. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on KFR. We'll be back with more right after this. They have a lot of excitement at the Mid-South Coliseum tonight. And the match that generated the most interest pitted Jerry Lawler against TV personality Andy Kaufman. And here's what happened in that match. Now, Kaufman has a headlock on Lawler, but Lawler turns it into a suplex. And Kaufman winds up on the deck. He is hurt, but Lawler is not finished. Watch what is about to happen. Now, Kaufman is going to win this match. He's the winner right there, imagine. Okay. So Lawler is going to put <laughs> is going to put a pile driver on. This is so illegal. And there's Jerry Calhoun trying to say, no, Jerry, don't do that. Don't do that. This is a pile driver, Mason, right here. And now watch. You think that 
doesn't hurt. Lawler put a couple of more on him before it was over. They took it. They brought an ambulance into the Coliseum. They put Kaufman into the ambulance, and away they go. Taking uh, Andy Kaufman to the hospital, he is there right now as the ambulance pulls out of the Coliseum. Kaufman is in the intensive care unit at St. Francis Hospital. He is at a battery of tests, and it is believed that he is not seriously injured. He'll be in the hospital at least overnight. But one thing for sure, according to his manager, Andy Kaufman's wrestling career is over. Welcome back to KFR. And we want to thank Scott Cornish for uh, appearing kind of at the last minute to help me break down the Andy Kaufman run in Memphis that was so memorable and epic. Unfortunately, it uh, did did sort of go out with a whimper at the end, but without a doubt, some of the most provocative television of all time that really transcended the wrestling business. You know, I I really think that the first meeting between the two in April of 82 uh, was performance art that was on a on a high level uh, than you'll see in professional wrestling. One of the most endearing moments of of my young fandom, without a doubt, uh, watching it all unfold. And the fact that I got to see the very first appearance of Andy at the Mid-South Coliseum is indeed very special. Uh, And which were unforgettable things that really could only happen in Memphis. I'm certainly glad that it did. I want to apologize for my outburst at the beginning of the show. Brian uh, actually called when we got wrapped up with Scott and he was in tears. And um, I consoled him and I was promised that that would never happen again. And hey, that's good enough for me. Well, I think that about wraps this segment up. (laughs) For Captain Lou, this is Scott Bowden. Bye-bye, everybody. Kentucky Fried Wrestling with Scott Bowden is a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. The announcers on this program are selected and paid by parties other than this station, namely the promoters of Championship Wrestling.